Hello and uh, welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Rochelle Ferguson, we are here coming up on this week's edition. A sweeping win for President Erdogan in parliamentary and presidential elections reveals a Turkey more politically divided than ever. Women in Saudi Arabia are euphoric after being given the green light to get behind the wheel legally. Plus, as the pharaohs are eliminated from the World Cup, Egypt's Coptic Christians say it's high time players from their community featured more on the national side. Well, we kick off this edition in Turkey, where President Tayyip Erdogan claimed a crushing victory in presidential and parliamentary elections this week, as well as securing sweeping new executive powers. Well, Erdogan's win has delighted his supporters, but left a fractured opposition dismayed. The pivotal polls once again shining the spotlight on Turkey's deep political divide. Erin Agunke reports. For some, he's one of the strongest leaders in Turkish history credited with bringing economic growth and stability to the country. But for others, he's the head of an increasingly brutal dictatorship. Reactions to Recep Tayyip Erdogan's victory were mixed, highlighting sharp political divisions in the country. Everything went really well. I'm really happy with the results. We have everything. Freedom is everywhere in Turkey. Nothing is banned. Maybe if the opposition had won, this wouldn't be the case. I voted and after the results I was hugely disappointed. I did my duty but I don't think most people voted for the right candidate. I'm so sad. I've even blocked all of my friends on Facebook who are celebrating. Opposition candidate Muharrem Ince conceded defeat on Monday and encouraged President Erdogan to work towards uniting the population. Mr. Erdogan, as of today, please do not act like the head of the AK Justice and Development Party. Be the president of 81 million Turks. Be everyone's president. End this tension. Though he accepted the results, Ince suggested he was disadvantaged by limited airtime, describing Erdogan's rule as a, quote, one-man regime. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe echoed the opposition leader's concerns, criticizing the prolonged state of emergency and the unequal media coverage of the different candidates. Nonetheless, observers said voters did have a genuine choice in the election and praised the high voter turnout. The finalized results of Sunday's elections will be released on July 5th. Next, I feel free like a bird. The words of one female driver this week is, for the first time in Saudi Arabia's history, women got behind the wheel legally. Until now, women in the kingdom have had to rely on drivers or a male relative to get around. The move is all part of reforms by the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Wasim Korne has this details. In the driver's seat for the first time, this Saudi woman is finally allowed to enter her car without needing a driver, her husband, father, brother or son to drive it for her. For millions of other Saudi women, this will become a reality in the coming weeks and months as the kingdom continues to issue driver's licenses. For weeks, women have taken to social media to describe what they would do once they got behind the wheel. Things as mundane as getting coffee or ice cream. And for them, the first ride across town was a moment to indulge and enjoy. I'm a big fan of shawarma. <laughs> So I think I'm going to drive to uh, Mama Noura. It's a really popular uh, shawarma place in the Saudi, actually in Riyadh. So I think I'm going to drive myself there and get some uh, food. <laughs> the move has come amidst a push to turn Saudi Arabia into a less conservative society. Prince Mohammed bin Salman issued a decree ending the driving ban last year. In recent months, driving schools for women have opened and driver's licenses were issued. According to a consulting firm, some six million women are expected to apply for a license. For months now, women have been getting ready for the change, taking driving classes, going go-karting, using simulators and even attending auto shows. On the streets of Riyadh, women are spurring others to embrace the change. I encourage all Saudi women to drive. To those who are hesitant, go for it. The initial optimism has somewhat waned after a crackdown on women activists. Nine women who had long opposed the driving ban remain in prison. They are facing charges of undermining the kingdom's security and aiding enemies of the state.
Now, almost a year after the Islamic State group were flushed out of Iraq's second city, Mosul, independent radio stations are making a comeback there. Now, the stations are now free to broadcast programmes ranging from music to current affairs. Teenager Nur El Tai has been offered her own slot on the airwaves, this after impressing judges in a local radio contest. Gena Lee explains. This is Mosul's first independent radio station post-ISIS. Radio enthusiasts created 1FM six months after the city was retaken by Iraqi forces. Creators say the station has no political affiliations and is run by volunteers. One of their anchors is Noor Al Tai, a 16-year-old who has not let her blindness get in the way of achieving her dreams. The reason I chose the field of media is that through it, I can help people and give hope to people who are in situations that are similar to mine, blind or with disabilities. One of them offered her airtime for a weekly show on Iraqi society after they spotted her in a local radio competition. Our main objective is to promote the spirit of tolerance, love, brotherhood and coexistence among the people of Nineveh. It's a message that we need right now, especially because our community has come out of war, division and strife, and we need to heal. This is not the only independent Mosulite radio station. There are two others in the area and two more created by displaced Mosul residents in Erbil. Art, music and entertainment were banned under the Islamic State group's rule. But now people slowly have more access to culture through the airwaves. We as taxi drivers work late into the night and we can listen to the songs and useful programs, not just propaganda chants and stories of war and fighting. A range of shows on the airwaves a welcome distraction from the struggles of rebuilding a war-torn city. Now, despite a fiercely fought World Cup campaign and even saving a penalty by Portugal's Cristiano Ronaldo, Iran has been knocked out of the tournament. A 1-0 draw with Portugal on Monday wasn't enough to keep Team Mele's World Cup hopes alive. Iran joins both Saudi Arabia and Egypt, who've also packed their bags for the journey home. Saudi Arabia leaving the competition with three points in the standing following a 2-1 win over Egypt. The Pharaohs, though, failing to win a match or earn any points at the competition. Well, despite a premature exit, Egypt's appearance at the World Cup was the country's first in 28 years and a major cause for celebration amongst fans. Coptic Christians, though, say it's high time more young men from their community were given a shot at playing professional football. Since 1908, just five Christian players have made the national side. Delano D'Souza has this report. This football academy in Alexandria is truly one of a kind. Here, football enthusiasts gather to do what they love. The only difference is nearly everyone is Christian. I was six years old when I first started playing football. I went to the coach for the first time to pay the fees and register my name. I told him my name is Hani Marus and he replied, you're going to make things hard for us. We have gone through really hard things. The Coptic Christian footballers say the discrimination they face registering at regular football clubs in Egypt has nothing to do with their abilities on the pitch. The idea is rooted in people's minds. They think Christians don't practice sport, they're raised in a church from a young age, they don't join clubs or engage in social activities, their body is weak, so Christians don't know how to play, they can't perform. The football academy, which keeps its doors open to non-Christian players, was founded by 22-year-old Mina Bendari. He began with around 30 players three years ago and today has nearly 300 footballers in centres around the country. When a Christian goes to a club and passes the test, he won't play, he won't even appear, because they reject Christians. People in charge in the Egyptian Football Association and in the clubs are all Muslims, so they're the ones responsible when it comes to the problem. Football, meanwhile, remains a popular sport in Egypt, and no one has made the country more proud than Liverpool forward Mohamed Salah, who represented Egypt at the World Cup. Everyone here says their dreams are just like his. 
My dream and everyone's dream is to play in the Egyptian national team and to be an international player. As football fever grips much of the world, a US-based NGO, Coptic Solidarity, has submitted a report to FIFA detailing the rampant discrimination in Egyptian football. There are currently 540 players in Egypt's top clubs, but only one among them is Coptic Christian. Well, you're up to date with Middle East Matters for this week. Don't forget you can contact us by visiting our Facebook page, Middle East Matters at France 24, or you can drop us a tweet. See you at the same time next week. Inside the Americas, presented by Jeannie Godula. From North America to the southern tip of Patagonia, Join us for a look at the latest political, economic, cultural and social news from the Americas. I think closing loopholes is a good thing. Inside the Americas on France 24 and France24.com.